I now call to order the Society's 2,444th meeting in the 150th year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends to tonight's lecture by Pedro Dominguez. Tonight is the Society's annual meeting in time for the president to report on the activities of the past fiscal year. As many of you know, all of the past year's meetings have been conducted using Zoom. I'm pleased to report that the society did well last year, despite the loss of in-person events. There are 20 meetings in all, a 25% increase over any previous year. The lectures were diverse, sophisticated, and well-received. Dues payments were 97% of the previous year, and additional contributions and sponsorships were strong as well. Income from the membership well exceeded the society's expenses. In addition, PSW's invested reserve funds enjoyed very strong growth. Only new member applications were down significantly from the past two years, probably due to the lack of in-person meetings. Live stream attendance on Zoom and YouTube averaged over 100 without adjusting for multiple viewers per logon. The Society continues to post edited versions of meeting recordings to the PSW web channels. In all, 169 recordings have been posted to both the YouTube and Vimeo PSW channels. Collectively, they have been viewed over 530,000 times, and there are over 5,600 subscribers to the PSW YouTube channel. Membership on other social media grew modestly over the past year as well. The society is looking forward to continued growth in the current year, in the coming year, increasing its capacity to utilize projective and participatory technologies like Zoom and to some new programming initiatives as well. The finances were audited and found to be sound and without objection. A copy of the audit committee report and the financial report are available by request to the corresponding secretary at correspondingsec at pswscience.org. Org. Respectfully submitted, Larry Milstein, President, PSW. The Society has been meeting and hosting lectures via Zoom for over a year, starting with the Joseph Henry Lecture on May 15, 2020, almost a year and a half now. The first four meetings this fall also will be done via Zoom, at least partly due to COVID-related restrictions and partly due to speaker travel limitations. We remain optimistic, nonetheless, that the society will be able to meet again in person, perhaps by the end of the year. Of course, we are at the mercy of the pandemic and the measures the authorities institute to deal with it. While we hope for the best, whether in person or not, the society will continue meeting and live streaming events and it will be working assiduously to learn how to utilize the new tools of video production and social meeting to bring science to everyone and to enhance the value of membership. The Society is grateful to the sponsors of the 2021-2022 lecture series for their support. The Policy Studies Organization, in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous sponsor who has asked to remain anonymous. Please join me in thanking them.
I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to the society. Brian Swoski, a patent examiner at the US Patent and Trademark Office, interested in chemical engineering, physical chemistry, and applied mathematics, who learned of PSW on the internet. Jim Ramarsik, a Distinguished Career Institute Fellow at Stanford University, interested in aerospace and robotics, entrepreneurship and new business development, who learned of PSW from her friend. Thomas Masterson, a physician interested in healthcare information technology, who learned of PSW from YouTube. And tonight's speaker, Pedro Dominguez, whose interests will be clear to you in some small part from tonight's proceedings. We welcome them all to membership. Welcome. If you are not a member and would like to support the society, you can do so through the PSW website. We welcome new members. Just look for the join button on the home page of the PSW website. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2,443rd meeting and the lecture by Steve Stitch on NASA's commercial crew program. James, the screen is yours. Hi, good evening, everyone. On June 18th, 2021, by Zoom webinar broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 2,443rd meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. He welcomed new members, and the recording secretary read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Steve Stitch, Program Manager for NASA's Commercial Crew Program. His lecture was titled, NASA's Commercial Crew Program, Returning America to Human Space Flight. NASA aims to turn over work in low Earth orbit to allow the agency to focus on the frontiers of exploration. That process began in 2004 with cargo missions to the International Space Station. It continues now in the Commercial Crew Program and will eventually lead to commercial operations in lunar orbit and to Mars. Stitch said the Commercial Crew Program specifically focuses on developing low Earth orbit into a robust, vibrant enterprise with many launch providers and a wide range of government and public uses. The program deviates from NASA's historical approach to contracting for hardware and services. Notably, first, the vehicles developed as a part of the program to meet NASA's demands will remain privately owned and available for non-NASA purposes. Second, industry will be responsible for an end-to-end -end transportation system that provides all the components and infrastructure required to operate a mission. Stitch said that further unlike prior NASA programs, the commercial crew program is keeping its technical requirements at a high level to allow industry partners discretion in designing and developing their hardware and processes. Stitch then described the program's evolution from initially providing seed money to industry partners for developing technologies to recently awarding contracts to Boeing and SpaceX to conduct test flights. On those missions, NASA astronauts work directly with the private firms as part of a team. Other federal agency partners, such as the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Commerce, Department of Defense, Federal Communications Commission, and the National Transportation Safety Board also participate in supporting and regulating the test flights. Stitch said that, that involving these federal partners is important for transitioning commercial space flights out of NASA's oversight and into its own market sector. This transition will allow NASA to focus on developing new spacecraft to push the boundaries of existing space travel. Stitch then described the Boeing CST-100 Starliner and the SpaceX Crew Dragon transportation systems in great detail, comparing and contrasting the two commercial approaches. The United States returned to human spaceflight in May 2021, when Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin flew on SpaceX's Crew Dragon to orbit and back. Multiple human groups has since flown on commercial spacecraft to and from the ISS. Stitch also mentioned the space tourism industry being pioneered by Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. He said the low Earth orbit economy is beginning to take off, and he predicted a privately owned space station in the future. The speaker then answered questions from the online viewing audience. President Milstein asked whether the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser remains a viable program. 
The speaker said the commercial crew program is not currently funding Sierra Nevada's work, but is consulting with the company on a cargo vehicle to return signs from the ISS. Another member asked whether the SpaceX Starship will be part of the commercial crew program. The speaker said the program does not currently intend to award a contract for Starship, but that SpaceX could pitch the vehicle for other NASA missions. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. President Milstein adjourned the meeting at 9.49 p.m. The temperature in Washington, D.C., 28 degrees Celsius. The weather, partly cloudy. And the number of concurrent viewers on the Zoom and YouTube live stream, 51. And views on the PSW Science YouTube and Vimeo channels, 156. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. The minutes will be posted to the website in due course. Uh, please send any comments or corrections on the minutes to corresponding secretary Robin Taylor at corresponding sec at pswscience.org. And we now turn to tonight's lecture on the ultimate software, machine learning and intelligence it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Pedro Dominguez. Pedro is professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Washington. He works in the areas of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. He is a founder of the fields of statistical relational AI, data stream mining, adversarial learning, machine learning for information integration, and influence maximization in social networks. He is also co-founder of the International Machine Learning Society. Pedro is an author on over 200 technical publications and is the solo author of The Master Algorithm, a book about machine learning and AI. He writes widely on AI for the media, and his pieces have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, The Spectator, Scientific American, and Wired, to name a few. Among other awards, Pedro has received two of the highest honors in data science and AI, the Innovation Award of the Association for Computing Machinery, Special Interest Group for Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining, and the McCarthy Award of the International Joint Conferences on Artificial Intelligence. Pedro is an elected fellow of both the AAAS and the AAAI. He earned his undergraduate degree at the Technical University of Lisbon and his MS and PhD at UC Irvine. All questions will be fielded after the lecture during the Q&A session. Pedro, the screen is yours. Uh, thanks, Larry, and thanks everyone uh, for being here virtually. Uh, let me start with a very simple question, which is where does knowledge come from? Until recently, it came from just one of three sources. Evolution, that's the knowledge that's encoded in your DNA. Experience, that's the knowledge that's encoded in your neurons. And culture, uh, which is the knowledge that we all acquire by talking to other people, reading books, and so on. And everything we are, everything we do is really the product of these three different sources of knowledge. Now, what's remarkable and what I'm going to talk about here is that in just recent decades, a new, a fourth source of knowledge has appeared on the planet, and that's computers. More and more knowledge in the world is discovered by computers and is maintained by computers. And this is as big of a change as each one of those three was before. Evolution, well, that's life on Earth. Uh, you know, neural learning is, you know, what distinguishes, you know, mammals from insects and plants. And culture is, is what makes humans humans and, and as successful as we are. And, and computers are going to be, the discovery of knowledge by computers is going to be as, as big as each of these. Uh, Notice also that each of these sources of knowledge discovers knowledge orders of magnitude faster and in orders of magnitude more quantities uh, than the previous ones. 
And the same is true of computer. It is going to, uh, uh, computers will ultimately discover far more knowledge uh, than, than the previous uh, sources. So this is a really um, important development that I think is not just for computer scientists to, to know about, but for everyone uh, to know about and, and understand. In fact, Jan Lecun, uh, who is a well-known uh, machine learning researcher and director of AI research at Facebook says that most of the knowledge in the world in the future is going to be extracted by machines and will reside in machines. So how, how does this happen? Uh, well, uh, discovering knowledge by a computer is the realm of machine learning. And that's what I'm gonna try to do here is give you a sense of what machine learning is and what the different paradigms are and, and, and the issues and, and the, some of the major applications. But let me just try by summarizing uh, you know, the main idea, which is in some sense, the idea of, of machine learning as in, in contrast to traditional programming. In traditional programming, which is what, you know, computers did until recently, uh, there's a computer, uh, data, and then algorithm to process that data go in and out comes the output, right? All the things that we know work, work, work on that principle, like for example, a text editor or an ATM or, or a program to solve fluid dynamics or you name it. Now, what happens in machine learning is that uh, this is turned around. In machine learning, data and the desired output go in and the computer produces the algorithm or its estimate of the algorithm that will turn that data into, or, or that will turn that, turn that data into that output and in the future, will turn other data into the output that we desire. So in a way, a machine learning algorithm is a very different kind of algorithm for the, from the ones that went before. It's something you might call a master algorithm because it's an algorithm that makes other algorithms. And as you can imagine, if you can do this, it is exceedingly powerful, not just in terms of making things faster or better than before, but in terms of making computers do things that we wouldn't even know how to program to, them to do, like for example, um, driving a car or or, or, or modeling how cells work, which are two very uh, prominent applications these days. So, so how do computers discover new knowledge? How, you know, is, this maybe sounds a little bit like magic at this point, how does this happen? Well, that's what, you know, the main part of this talk is going to be about. And there are really five major ways. Uh, the first one is to fill in gaps in existing knowledge in much the same way that scientists work, right? We have a body of knowledge, we have an explained phenomena, uh, and then we try to figure out what is that we're missing. And then we contrast that, we, we, you know, we apply that to new experiments, to new data, we see if it works, we see if it needs to be refined and we keep going. So this is one uh, you know, very important way to discover new knowledge. In some sense, automating the scientific method. Another one very popular these days under the name of deep learning is to emulate the brain. After all, the brain is the greatest learning system there is in the world. So maybe we can reverse engineer it and come up with good learning algorithms that way. In a similar vein, another approach is to simulate evolution, right? Evolution is very powerful. It produces the brain and, and, you know, and a lot of other things as well. So maybe we can learn by simulating evolution on the computer. Another way uh, is to realize that all knowledge that is learned from data is necessarily uncertain, right? We're never sure if the knowledge was you know, you know, obtained by inducing from data. So what we should do perhaps is to quantify that uncertainty using probability and then keep track of how the probability of different hypotheses changes uh, as, we, as we see more evidence. And the final approach is um, analogical reasoning, uh, is what, you know, according to psychologists, humans do all the time, uh, which is to notice similarities between the situation that you're in and previous ones, and then apply what worked in those situations to the new one that you're in. And associated with each of these approaches, there's a major school of thought a paradigm in machine learning and, and you know, what you might call a tribe of machine learning. And uh, one of the things that's uh, interesting, I would even say quite fun and, and, and fascinating about machine learning is that each of these tribes has its origins in, in a different field of science or, or multiple ones even. And so when you're studying machine learning, you actually have a good excuse to study all these other things as well. So for example, uh, uh, the machine learning researchers that, tr that try to emulate the scientific method, uh, that tribe goes by the name, the symbolists. 
and their origins are in logic and, and philosophy. The people who try to reverse engineer the brain are called connectionists because the knowledge is in the connections between neurons. And they, of course, have their origins in, in neuroscience. The evolutionaries are the people who try to simulate evolution. They have their origins in, in evolutionary biology. The, the people who model uncertainty and try to quantify it and, and, and compute it and update it are the Bayesians. And their origins, of course, are in statistics. And finally, the analogizers, uh, they have, you know, origins in actually a, a bunch of different fields, but probably the single most important one is psychology. And each of these tribes also has a master algorithm, an algorithm that uh, can in principle be learned, can, sorry, can in principle be used to learn any knowledge from data. And in fact, each of these algorithms has a theorem that says, if you give it enough data, it can learn any function. So they are in principle very powerful. They're also very different. And we're gonna see what they are and, and what their applications are. For symbolists, the master algorithm is inverse deduction. For connectionists, it's back propagation. For the evolutionaries, it's genetic programming. For Bayesians, it's probabilistic inference using Bayes' theorem and, and hence the name. And for the analogizers, the, the most widely used method is, is kernel machines. Uh, you know, kernel being the technical term for a similarity uh, function, uh, also known as, as a support vector machines. And we're going to look at each uh, one of these in turn and some of their main uh, uh, applications. So let's start uh, with, the, with the symbolists, which is in some ways the most computer science-y uh, of, of the five approaches and, and also uh, one of the earliest. So here are some of the, the uh, best known, most important uh, symbolists in the world. There's Tom Mitchell at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Steve Muggleton at Imperial College in the UK, and, and Ross Quinlan in Australia. And uh, the basic idea in um, uh, symbolic learning is actually um, a very intuitive and, and, and really brilliant one, I would say, which is to um, notice that in mathematics, uh, a lot of very important discoveries come uh, from inverting things that we already knew how to do. So for example, subtraction is the result of inverting addition and integration is the inverse of differentiation. And the idea here is that we're going to do the same thing with logic. Uh, in particular, induction, right? Learning is induction, is going from specific facts to general rules. And that is the inverse of deduction, which we understand very well. Every computer is a deduction machine and, it, and deduction is really going from general rules to specific facts. So how does inverse deduction work? Well, here's a very simple, um, you know, way, uh, analogy actually to, to explain this. Addition uh, gives us the answer to the question, if I add two and two, what do I get? And the answer of course is four. Uh, that's not the deepest thing you'll hear today. So subtraction gives us the answer to the inverse question, which is what do I need to do to add, what do I need to add to two in order to get four? Now, similarly, deduction, uh, lets you answer questions like, if I know that Socrates is human and that humans are mortal, then what can I infer from that? And the answer, of course, is that by deduction, by modus ponens, I can infer that Socrates is mortal. Now, induction answers the inverse question, which is, if I know that Socrates is human, what else do I need to know in order to infer that he's mortal? And the answer, of course, is that I need to know that humans are mortal. And now I've just induced the new rule. Of course, in practice, they wouldn't just be induced from Socrates, it would be used from a whole bunch of different people. But at the end of the day, I have this rule that I can now compose deductively with many other rules to answer questions that might be very different from anything that I actually saw in the data. And this is very powerful and the, and the symbolists are the only ones that can do this. Now, of course, in reality, this is not done in natural language as on the slide, it's done in a formal language like first order logic, but, but the basic idea is, is essentially the same. And, and as I said, this is very reminiscent of, of how scientists work, right? They notice a gap in their knowledge and then they try to fill that in and then they apply that to further data and, and see what happens. And in fact, one of the most fascinating and potentially important applications of this type of learning is precisely uh, to automate science. So if you look at this uh, picture, the, the biologist in it is actually not the guy in the lab coat, that's uh, um, Ross King, uh, a, a machine learning uh, researcher. Uh, the, the biologist in the picture is the machine in the background. 
The machine in the background is a system that uses, it starts with basic knowledge of biology, DNA, RNA, proteins, and so on. And then it studies some phenomenon, some organism like say yeast. And then it uses inverse deduction to formulate hypotheses. And then it designs the experiments to test those hypotheses and physically carries them out uh, with microarrays and, and, and uh, DNA sequences, which is what you see in the background here. Uh, you know, the, the system here is called Eve. There was a previous one called Adam and Eve uh, recently discovered the new malaria drug. So this is an example of what you can do with inverse deduction. And notice that once you have one robot scientist like this, there's nothing preventing you from making millions, okay? And so if you're a scientist, instead of, you know, working with 50 postdocs, you can work with, you know, 50 million of these machines, which uh, kind of takes everything to a whole different level. Now, um, this is one school uh, and, you know, it has its fans. Uh, it also has its critics. In particular, uh, historically, the biggest critics of this approach have always been the connectionists, the people who want to reverse engineer the brain. They say that, you know, this is too artificial, too clean. Most knowledge isn't discovered by, you know, writing logic on a piece of paper and, and you know, trying to do logical operations with it. It's, you know, discovered by people in real life. And, 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 and what's doing that discovery? It's their brains. So maybe the, the way to come up with a really powerful learning algorithm is to take what we know of how the brain works and try to do algorithms that are inspired by that. And the most um, famous, most important connectionist in the world is um, uh, Jeff Hinton, who started as a psychologist um, uh, 40 years ago uh, and has been working, you know, his dream is to figure out, you know, the algorithm by which the brain works and has been very persistent uh, in pursuit of that, of that dream. He's more of a computer scientist than a, than a psychologist these days, but this is the question that he's working on. In fact, he tells the story of uh, coming home from work one day saying, yay, I did it. I figured out how the brain works. And, and his daughter replied, oh, dad, not again. Uh, so, um, you know, he's the first to admit that he's had some successes and some failures, but uh, you know, he's one of the co-inventors of backpropagation, which is everywhere these days, including, you know, uh, in your cell phone. So, you know, the successes at this point, I would say far outweigh the failures. And two other famous connectionists are Yan Wutan and Yoshua Benjo. These three people uh, uh, won the Turing Award, the Nobel uh, Prize of Computer Science a few years ago for their work on, on deep learning, which is really the modern, their, you know, rebranding of connectionism, uh, also known as, as, as neural networks. So, so how does connectionism work? Well, uh, let's reverse, you know, let's open up the hood, open up the cranium, if you will, and see what's happening in the brain. The brain is made of neurons. And, and the neuron is a very uh, interesting, you could even say a very strange type of cell. It has a cell body and, it, and then it has this, it's, a neuron is a little bit, looks a little bit like a microscopic tree. The tree, the tree trunk is something called the axon, and then the branches are called dendrites. But then where things get very weird is that the branches of one tree connect with the roots of other trees at these junctions called synapses. And so, you know, your brain is really the densest, most fantastically nightmarish jungle that you've ever seen. Uh, but all your knowledge, everything you've ever learned is actually contained in the strength of those synapses. What happens is that when two neurons that are connected by a synapse fire at the same time, the synapse gets stronger. There's a biochemical process that we're not gonna, that's not relevant to us, but the synapse gets stronger, making it easier for the upstream neuron to make the downstream one fire in the future. And so what we can do is, and this you know, was done back in the 50s, is build the simplest model of a neuron we can imagine, because the goal here is not to be faithful to the biology, is to, you know, there's people who do that, but the goal here is, is to just come up with, with a good learning algorithm. And then we can take that model and we connect it into big networks and then, and then, and then we learn the weights on those connections. So what is the simplest model of a, of a neuron we can have? Well, uh, I have a bunch of inputs. They could be other neurons or they could be pixels in your retina or an image. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply each of those inputs by a weight. This is the strength of the synapse. And then I add the results. And the way a neuron works is that there's current, in, right? You know, neurons work by firing electric discharges along their axons that then, you know, cause these biochemical processes in the synapses. And, and so if, if the charge, if all the current coming in 
exceeds a threshold in a given period of time, then the, the neuron itself fires. There's a new action potential, which then may make further neurons fire, right? So the way we're gonna model this is we multiply each input by a weight, and then uh, we pass this through a threshold. If the weighted sum of inputs is above some value, then the output is one, meaning the neuron is firing. Otherwise it's zero, meaning the neuron is not firing. So for example, if your input was an image of a cat and this neuron is supposed to be a cat detector, then it should you know, be one if, if, if you are seeing a cat, but if you're seeing a dog or your grandmother, right, the famous grandmother cell, then this neuron shouldn't fire, the grandmother cell should fire, okay? So this is all, uh, you know, uh, very straightforward. The really tricky problem, and one that was considered unsolvable for, for many years, during which neural networks were dormant, and then was finally solved. I mean, it's actually been solved before, but it was only, the solution only became, you know, known and widely used in the 80s. And this was the famous backpropagation algorithm, which is arguably the most important algorithm in machine learning these days. So, so what does backpropagation do? Well, if you think of a very large network of neurons and your brain has, you know, 85 billion uh, with, with trillions of connections and artificial neural networks are actually getting to the point where they're not that much smaller than that, believe it or not, right? There's these days artificial neural networks with billions and, and tens or even in the largest cases over hundred billion parameters. And now if you, if you show this network a cat and it should be outputting one, but it's actually outputting zero, it's making a mistake, right? If the output is one, then all is well and nothing needs to change. But if there's an error, then the question becomes, how do I change the weights in this network to correct that error? And this is actually, there's no obvious answer to this question because think about it. Here I have one little neuron uh, in the middle of a network of you know, billions of neurons. And you know, how do I decide how and in what, you know, to what extent this neuron is responsible for the error? This is a, a very important problem in machine learning. It happens in any large learning system and it's called the credit assignment problem. Or maybe it should be called the blame assignment problem because you know, it's about you know, who, who should take the blame uh, when something goes wrong. And backpropagation is precisely a solution to this problem. And the essence of the idea is actually remarkably simple, which makes you wonder why it wasn't discovered many decades before, but, but there you go. That's, that's how science uh, uh, often works. And the idea in backprop is this, is I'm going to change each weight a little bit while keeping all the others constant. And I'm gonna see what change that causes in the output. So for example, if the output should be one, but right now it's 0.2. And when I change this weight, the output goes up a little bit, then this is a good change because it'll bring me closer to my goal, right? On the other hand, if when I increase this weight, the output becomes 0.15, then it's making things worse, right? So in the last layer closest to the output, if, if, if a neuron is outputting one, right? And, and the output of the whole system should be zero, then its weight needs to go up. And so the way back prop does is it uses calculus, as, as you may already be guessing, uh, to figure out what is the derivative, the partial derivative of the air in the output with respect to all the weights in the final layer. And then based on those, you know, how the weights in the previous layer are responsible for what happens in the neurons in that layer and therefore in the final output. So you actually, you know, you compute the output going, going from, you know, the, going forward through the network, but then the errors and the changes in weights are computed going backward through the network from one layer to the previous one. And that's why this is called backpropagation or backprop for short. And as I mentioned, these days backprop is everywhere. It's used, uh, you know, in search engines, uh, to figure out what results to show to you. It's used for ad placement. It's used you know, by Twitter and Facebook to recommend things. It's used in image recognition, speech recognition on your phone, you know, Siri, you know, et cetera, use, use backprop. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's for machine translation uh, in the stock market, um, et cetera, et cetera. But one, you know, still one of the most famous uh, of these applications uh, because it was, you know, on the front page of, of the New York Times uh, a few years ago, uh, is what has come to be known as, as the Google Cat Network. Uh, it actually can recognize many other things besides cats. It was the journalist who called it the Google Cat Network, uh, because actually it, it recognizes cats much better than anything else, uh, because it has the most data on cats. And, and the reason for that is that uh, the network was learned from YouTube videos. So maybe you should call this the couch potato network because what it did was you know, watch you know, hours and hours and hours on end 
a video. People really like to upload videos of their cats. So there was a lot of cat data. And you know, this at the time was the biggest network ever built. It had about, I think a billion weights. Now, as I mentioned, there's networks with over, you know, just years later, uh, you know, things have been going up exponentially and there's networks with, uh, with hundreds of billions of weights, which is still, you know, uh, behind humans, but, you know, but already I have many animals. So, uh, you know, progress is very rapid. And, and, and this Google Cat Network was remarkably uh, able to recognize things like, you know, cats and dogs and whatnot to a level that just wasn't possible before. And, and things have, you know, um, gotten, you know, much better ever since. And, and, and they continue to improve in, in many areas. So deep learning is, is certainly right now the area of, of these five where there's the greatest amount of research going on and, and, the, and, the, and the most rapid progress. Now, uh, the evolutionaries uh, also take inspiration from biology, but they look at this and they say, well, yeah, all the connections are doing is learning the weights on these systems that have already been rigidly architected. But where did that architecture come from, right? Uh, well, that question is answered by evolution. The archi you know, your experience may, may tune the, the weights of your synapses or the strengths of them, but it was evolution that actually you know, discovered the structure of that brain. And we roughly know how evolution works. So maybe what we should do is uh, uh, simulate evolution on a computer and see what it can produce. And the great pioneer in this area was John Holland, who uh, passed away a few years ago. In fact, you know, uh, for, for some decades, the joke was that evolutionary learning was John, his students and their students, but then in the 80s, things exploded. Um, John Koza uh, uh, was one of those, uh, you know, he, he, John Holland called what he did genetic algorithms because they're inspired by genetics. Uh, John Koza created a more powerful version called genetic programming that we will also look at. And Hal Lipson is one of the people doing some of the most uh, exciting applications of this um, today, as, as we will see in a little bit. So uh, how does evolution work and how can we implement it on the computer? Again, all we need is a kind of sketch version of this. We're not you know, interested in the, in the details because the goal here is not to do biology, it's, it's to do machine learning. So at any point in time, uh, you have a population. In biology, each population, each individual of that population would be a genome, uh, which would be, you know, a series of, of, of nucleotides, of base pairs. For us, it's just gonna be a, a string of bits on the computer. So that string of bits represents some program. And I have a population of them. And then what I do is I evaluate each of these programs at the task that I'm trying to learn. And the, 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 the programs that do better get a higher fitness score as in nature. And then the programs with the highest fitness score get to mate. Literally, I produce a new bit string by crossing over part of the bit string of the mother uh, string and part of the, the, and, and, and the, the father string. And then I, I randomly flip some of the bits to emulate uh, mutation. And then I do this some number of times and now I have a new, a new, a new generation, a new population. And, and what is amazing is that if I do this, just starting with a bunch of random strings, uh, after maybe thousands or tens of thousands of, of generations, which on a computer need not take that long, uh, I, I can have solutions to many problems that are better than the ones that humans came up with. Like for example, there are patents uh, for radios and amplifiers and, and, and other circuits that were created you know, uh, for circuits that were created by uh, genetic algorithms, which often work in ways that are very unintuitive to human uh, uh, electrical engineers, but, but, but they do their job. Now, uh, John Coase's idea was, was to take this one step further uh, by noticing the following, which is that a string is a very low level representation of a program. And just you know, cutting off that string some point you know, and, and starting with another, which is what happens in, 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 in biological sexual reproduction is probably going to muck things up. Uh, a, a program is really a tree of subroutine calls all the way down to elementary operations like addition, multiplication and or and whatnot. So the idea in genetic programming is that instead of strings, I'm going to have program trees. And then the way I do crossover is that I pick a random node in each of the trees and I switch the subtrees, and now I have two new child programs. And for example, what you see on this slide, uh, the, the white nodes, once you form that tree, uh, are one of Kepler's laws, in particular, the one that gives the, um, uh, the, the duration of a, of a planet's year as a function of its average distance from the sun. And these things are very, and much more complicated ones are, are quite straightforward for, for genetic algorithms to discover. 
uh, in fact, these days, um, you know, people, you know, the, the, the people who do this type of learning don't just discover equations or simple programs or electronic circuits anymore. They actually work on whole robots. So for example, this little spider here is a product, is a, is a product of, uh, of evolutionary learning. Uh, this is from, from Hot Lipson's lab. And the way this works is the little start with a random soup of parts, right? Just components. And initially this works in simulation. And once you have a robot in simulation that looks like it might work in practice, it gets 3D printed and thrown into the real world. The spiders start to crawl, the dragonflies start to fly, and, and then you score them for how fast they move, their ability to recover from injury and things like that. And, 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 and then you get things like this. You get you know, actual little you know, artificial animals that move around. So, so this is uh, exciting, maybe also a little scary, right? If, uh, you know, if Terminator comes to be, may, maybe, this is, maybe this is how it'll happen. Of course, you know, these little insects and other you know, strange creatures that they've come up with are not exactly ready to take over the world, but they've come a long way from, from the super parts that, that they started with. Now, um, the connectionists and the evolutionaries take their inspiration from biology, which is a natural thing to do, but actually most people in machine learning think that's a questionable idea because you know, biology is random. Who knows if it did the best thing or, or something very strange, very odd, very random. Uh, what we should do, according to a lot of people in the field, is figure out from first principles, what is the optimal way to learn from data and then to make decisions based on what we've learned. And then our learning algorithm should be based on that. And the best uh, representatives of this uh, uh, approach to machine learning are the Bayesians. And to them, you know, all learning algorithms, as we shall see shortly, should be based on this one thing, which is Bayes' theorem, which is where the name comes from. And the Bayesians are, by their own admission, you know, the most fanatical of all the machine learning tribes. They have an almost religious devotion uh, to this idea, which is uh, not by accident because they come from statistics. And in statistics, for 200 years, they were an oppressed minority, right? The frequentists dominated. Uh, but, but, you know, it's a good thing that they survived because, um, and they had to become very hardcore to survive. It's a good thing they survived because they've, they've made a lot of contributions. And, and in fact, these days, even within statistics, largely based on the power of computers and, you know, more than whatnot, they're actually on the ascendant as well. So um, probably the most famous Bayesian in the world is, is uh, uh, Huda Pearl, uh, who uh, won the Turing Award a few years ago for inventing, among other things, inventing uh, Bayesian networks, which are a very powerful type of, of Bayesian uh, model. Uh, there's also other people like David Heckham and, and, uh, and, and Mike Jordan. Uh, so how does this all work? By the way, here's Bayesians like Bayes theorem so much that um, you know, there was a, a machine learning startup a few years ago in London, I believe, that actually had the neon sign of Bayes theorem made and, and hung outside their offices for, for everyone to see. So, so here it is. But, but what does this mean, right? What, how does this work? Well, Bayes theorem, as many of you probably know, is, is a really elementary result in statistics. In fact, it's so elementary that it would barely be worth calling it theorem if it wasn't so important. But, but here's what it says, and here's how it's used in, in Bayesian learning. So the idea in, 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 in Bayesian learning is that I have a space of hypothesis about some phenomenon about the world, and I'm going to assign a probability to each hypothesis. It's probability of being true, if you will. And I'm going to start by doing that before I see any data. So before I see any data, each hypothesis has what is called its prior probability. It's a priori, how much do I believe that this is the right hypothesis, okay? And in fact, these priors are what makes Bayesianism controversial because a lot of statisticians and other scientists say, well, you have no grounds to make up probability distributions like that. And the Bayesian response to this, which you know, is a very valid one, is you have to make some assumptions uh, anyway, and no matter what you do, we're just being explicit about the assumptions that we're making and we're making them in the form of this prior distribution. But then of course, the, the important part begins, which is the data comes in. And now the idea is that the data is going to make some hypotheses more likely and others less. In, particularly, in particular, if the data is consistent with the hypothesis, the hypothesis becomes more likely and vice versa, right? And, and you know, the, 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 the quantity that encapsulates this is the probability of the data given the hypothesis, also known as the likelihood, right? And in fact, Frequent statisticians also use likelihood. That's what's in the maximum likelihood principle. And the idea is that 
if my hypothesis makes the evidence likely, then conversely, the evidence makes the hypothesis likely, right? That's the maximum likelihood principle. What Bayesians do is they combine that with the prior and multiply the two to give me my posterior probability up to a normalization constant called the marginal that, that we you know, needn't worry about here, okay? So as I see more data, the distribution becomes more and more sharply peaked around the more consistent hypothesis until hopefully there's just one that dominates, but you know, in principle, there could be more than one. But then you can make predictions based on those hypotheses weighted by their posteriors rather than on just a single hypothesis. And Bayesian learning has been used for all sorts of things. Uh, it's used in self-driving cars. It's used in, in a lot of uh, different sciences. Again, it's becoming more and more popular. But one application, Perhaps I'm guessing the most widespread application of vision learning and one that I think we are all grateful for is spam filters, right? Without spam filters, you know, our inboxes would be unmanageable. And uh, I mean, these days, a lot of different algorithms get used for spam filtering, but vision learning was the first one and still one of the best ones. So what happens here is that I'm trying to classify an email as being spam or not spam or ham as it's known. And uh, so my two hypotheses are this email is spam and this email is not spam. And I start with my prior probability that email is spam. Let's say 99.9% .9 probability it's spam, 0.1% it's not spam. And then the evidence is actually the content of the email. So for example, uh, if the email contains the word Viagra, that makes it more likely to be spam. If it contains the word free in all capitals, even more likely to be spam. If it contains four exclamation marks, almost certain to be spam in addition to those. Right? On the other hand, if it contains you know, the name of your best friend on the, on the, on the uh, signature line, then that makes it less likely to be spam. So you know, the, the, the vision learner tallies up all this evidence and at the end of the day, it produces a judgment as to whether this email is spam or not. And if it's spam, it goes in the spam folder and you don't have to deal with it. Of course, it's not error-free, but, but these days it's actually uh, pretty good and it's used billions of times every day. Finally, the analogizers. This is actually the approach to machine learning that most people find the most uh, intuitively appealing, which is perhaps most lay people, most non-machine learning researchers, which is perhaps not surprising because there's a lot of evidence from psychology that analogy is what human beings do all the time. So the idea in analogy-based um, uh, learning is that every time you have to solve a problem, what you do is you call up similar problems or parts of problems that you've encountered in the past and then you transfer what you did there to the new situation. And uh, probably the most famous researcher in this camp is Vladimir Vapnik, this is the inventor of kernel machines. Also Peter Hart, uh, he uh, produced some of the most important early results on nearest neighbor, which is the simplest, actually the simplest machine learning algorithm you can imagine. And yet it's very powerful in that it can learn any function. So we're gonna start by seeing what that is. Another uh, famous analogizer is Douglas Hofstadter. Uh, who you may know as the author of Gödel Escherbach, uh, which, you know, interestingly, is itself an extended analogy between Gödel's theorem, Bach's music, and, and, uh, and Escher's art. And, 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 and Doug really believes that uh, everything is analogy. In fact, his most recent book is 500 pages arguing that all of cognition, all of intelligence is nothing but analogy. So he really does think that analogy is the master algorithm. And in fact, he coined the term analogizer and, you know, in the book, he shows how Einstein was an analogizer, Galois is an analogizer. We do analogy, you know, in the smallest details of our lives. So, you know, that's, he's very much, you know, a, a very strong proponent of this, uh, of, of this approach. So how does this type of learning work? Uh, let me introduce it uh, to you by way of, of a simple puzzle. So I'm going to give you a, the map of two countries. Uh, in one, the cities are marked with plus signs, analogous to positive examples of a concept in machine learning, like say examples of a cat. And Negaland, where the cities are marked by minus signs, they are the negative examples, for example, things that aren't cats if you're trying to learn a cat classifier. And now the challenge is this. I only give you the locations of the cities marked with positive and negative signs on this map. And I want you to tell me where the border between the two countries is. So you can't do this exactly because the, you know, the cities don't determine the border, but you can probably you know, roughly put the border where it should be. And nearest neighbor is precisely a heuristic for doing this. Uh, and the heuristic is just the following, is, is 
It's, it's that I'm going to say that a point on the map is in Pakistan if it's closer to some city in Pakistan than to any city in Negaland. Okay. So what this does is it divides up the map into these areas where each city has what you might think of it as its metro area, the points that are closest to it than, than to all the others. And then Pakistan is just the union of the metro areas of the positive examples. And that's nearest neighbor for you. Of course, it's not in two dimensions, it's in many dimensions. And instead of you know, X, Y coordinates or latitude and longitude, you can have the symptoms of a patient. And what is the diagnosis for her? And then what I do is I look for the most similar patients and, and, I, and I apply to the new patient the, the diagnosis that, that I had or that was verified to be correct for the most similar patient in the past. And simple as this is, if you give it enough data and allow yourself to use more than one neighbor and do an average of them, this can actually learn any function in the world. And this is in fact the first algorithm that was proved by Peter Hart to have this property. So you could actually say in many ways it was the first true machine learning algorithm. And as you know, this was back in, in the, introduced in the 50s and then this was proved in the 60s, okay? So very simple and yet, you know, very powerful. It does have a couple of shortcomings, one of which you probably already noticed by just looking at this map is that this boundary is a little too jagged, right? You know, the real one is probably a little smoother. And another one is that this is going to remember a lot of examples that it doesn't need to. So for example, if I, if I threw out the, 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 the plus sign here at the lower left corner, its metro area would be absorbed by the metro areas of two other positive signs and the frontier wouldn't change at all. Okay. The only examples I need to keep around are what are called the support vectors, right? These are vectors of the variables and they're the support vectors because they're the ones that, that keep the border where it is. And in this simple example, that doesn't really matter, but when you have millions of examples, it does matter. Often you can throw out you know, most of them and, on, and only keep the ones that cause the boundary to be where it is. And the algorithm that does this is precisely kernel machines or support vector machines because you know, they use support vectors. And, 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 the, the, and they also produce you know, a, 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 a smoother frontier. And the way they work is, is by picking the frontier, the border between you know, the two regions that will, in addition to having all pluses on one side and around minuses on the other, will be as far away as possible from any of these examples, right? Think of those plus and minus signs now as mines in a minefield. If you have to cross the minefield, you know, south to north, uh, you will, you know, stay as far away as you can from, from all of the mines, right? It's not, you know, you won't just take any path. This is called maximizing the margin, right? It's the margin between you and the examples. And the support vector machine is mathematically what maximizes the margin uh, between, you know, the frontier and the examples on either side. And, and prior to the modern you know, decade of deep learning, if you will, the kernel machines were probably the most, the most popular uh, uh, machine learning method in the world. And they're still you know, the best for a lot of things as, as are, you know, uh, each, the algorithms in each of these paradigms each have the problems that they're the best for. And, and you know, that's certainly the case with, uh, with some of these uh, analogy-based algorithms. And you know, as, 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 as old as they are, um, They've, and, and widely studied as they are, they've been used for you know, almost anything you can imagine. But again, to pick one important application, the most important one for, you know, for people's daily lives is, is probably recommender systems, right? Recommender systems are what Netflix uses to suggest movies for you to see, Spotify to recommend uh, you know, songs and Amazon to recommend books and you know, Facebook to pick posts to show to you and tweets to pick tweets and so on, right? So this is used all over the place, you know, not just in e-commerce, but, but in a lot of other things. And, and the key insight in a recommender system to take, you know, Netflix as an example is the following. I want to recommend movies for you to see, right? And you could imagine doing this based on the properties of the movie. Is it an action movie? You know, who are the actors? But, but, um, you know, is it a drama? You know, who are the director? Who's the director, et cetera, et cetera. But this actually doesn't work that well because taste is a very subtle and complicated thing. The idea in recommended systems is to reason by analogies. I'm going to look for people who have similar tastes to you. And then the movies that they've seen that they liked, that they gave five stars to, for example, uh, I'm going to hypothesize that you will like as well and recommend to you. Okay. So what I have is for each person a vector of the star ratings that they give. And then I compare your vector with the vectors of other people. 
And, you know, you may have someone who has tastes very similar to yours, you know, like they could be on the other side of the globe, but they're your neighbor in taste space, as it's called. And then I recommend movies to you based, based on, on, on the fact that they like them and they're similar to you, right? And this, as I said, works uh, surprisingly well. Uh, so well that um, uh, reportedly three quarters of the, of the things that people watch on Netflix uh, come from the recommender system. And also reportedly a third, uh, these days probably more, but of course, you know, they don't make these figures public. A third of the things that people buy on Amazon come from the recommender system. So this really plays uh, an important part in our lives these days. And again, uh, at this point, every kind of machine learning has been applied to this problem because it's so important. But, um, you know, knowledge based learning was the first one and, and it's still uh, one of the best. So to summarize, uh, we've looked at the five uh, tribes of machine learning, the symbolists, connectionists, evolutionaries, Bayesians, and analogizers. We've also seen that each of these tribes has a problem that it can solve better than all the others and the master algorithm for solving that problem. So for symbolists, the problem is, is, is learning composable knowledge and they learn it using inverse deduction. For the connectionists, it's credit assignment and they do that using back propagation. For evolutionaries, it's to discover the structure of models, not just the parameters and they do that using genetic programming. For Bayesians, it's dealing with uncertainty, which they do using probability and, and base theorem and inference uh, over those. And for the analogizers, it's, it, it's learning by similarity. And in particular, when you have very few examples, uh, you can still learn by analogy when, when none of the others will work, right? So think of Niels, Bohr, Niels Bohr's um, you know, first uh, uh, model of quantum mechanics. It was a model of the atom based on analogy between an atom and the solar system, right? So he, you know, one example, and the analogies are, are the only ones that can do this. Again, if I just have a positive and negative example, I can already draw a frontier on the map, whereas all the other methods would be very confused. So analogizers, the, the most widely used method is kernel machines. And the most optimistic of these, uh, uh, of the people into these paradigms, you know, uh, uh, think that their algorithm is enough for everything. In fact, these days, the, the, the dom every decade, there's a different paradigm uh, dominating. It's interesting because they're all decades old, but the one that's, you know, on top changes. Right now, it's, it's of course, deep learning or connectionism. And the more optimistic connectionists think, you know, backpropagation is going to solve everything. And, you know, the others, uh, some of the others believe the same thing for their uh, algorithms. But I think the important thing to notice is that because each one of these is a real problem, none of the algorithms is going to solve all of them. What we need is a single algorithm that solves all five problems at the same time. And that would truly be deserving of the name, the master algorithm. What we need is in some sense, something analogous to the standard model in physics or the central dogma in biology, a unified theory of, of how learning works that we can then base uh, you know, all of our engineering and all of our applications on. So how might we do that? Well, a bunch of people have been working on that. In fact, these days it's, it's uh, newly popular. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's picked up a lot of speed in terms, for example, of combining um, symbolic methods with, with neural methods is a very big area these days. Uh, so a number of us have been working on this and, and certainly there's been a lot of progress. It at first might seem like a very hard problem. In fact, uh, some people have even claimed in the past that it was an impossible problem to solve because the algorithms look so different, right? How could you possibly unify them? Well, unifying them turns out to not be that hard once you realize that despite their variety, they all have the same three key elements in common. And those elements are representation, evaluation, and optimization. And if we figure out how to unify each of these in turn, then we're done. So let's start with the representation. The representation is the language that the computer uses to express, the, to write the program that it learned, okay? Uh, it would be Java or, or, or Python or C, or, or, or you know, it could be a natural language if you are human, but, but in, in AI, it's gonna be, you know, something like a formal language, something, you know, something more abstract, you know, more general, uh, easier to manipulate. Uh, and, and, and luckily, all of these languages that we use in computer science are really all variations, special cases of first order logic. So, for, and first logic is what the symbols already use. So first logic seems like a good starting point. On the other side, um, all of the huge variety of statistical models that people have, including uh, uh, many or most uh, deep networks, uh, are just special cases of graphical models. 
uh, you know, Bayesian networks that, you know, you the Pearl uh, introduced and I mentioned earlier are one. There's also Markov networks, but, you know, those already, so graphical models encompass where, you know, variables are nodes and connections between them represent dependencies. They already encompass a huge, uh, you know, number of things. If we can combine logic and graphical models, we, we basically have what we need for, for whatever we might want to learn. And, in, and indeed, people have done this uh, uh, in a number of ways, all of which amount to something like a probabilistic logic. The most widely used approach is something called Markov logic networks, which is a combination of Markov networks with, with, with first order logic. And the way it works is you have a series of formulas in first order logic as you would in an ordinary symbolic knowledge base, but then these formulas have weights. A formula uh, gets a high weight if you strongly believe in it. If, you know, if you're not sure about it, then you give it a low weight. And then the probability of the state of the world goes up with, with the number and the weight of the formulas that are true in it. So if I have a world where a lot of high weight formulas are true, then that's more likely than the world in which they are not. Okay, so the weighted formulas induce a distribution over, over states. And we can re, you know, represent pretty much every machine learned uh, model in this way, every, every program we might wanna learn. So that's the representation part. Uh, you know, again, for a while people thought this was impossible, but at this point this looks like essentially a solved problem. The next step is evaluation. Evaluation is the scoring function by which you decide that one model is better than another. Okay, and people use all sorts of things here, but most of them are special cases of the Bayesian posterior probability. So again, at some level, this is, a pro this is actually a problem that we almost don't even have to solve because it was already solved. Uh, however, I would say that what you really want here is not necessarily just the posterior probability, but the evaluation function should not be part of the algorithm. It should be provided by the user. It's for the user to say what it is that the learning should be optimized. If you're a company and you wanna maximize profit, well, then that should be your evaluation. If you're a user and you wanna maximize your happiness, then some measure of your happiness should be your evaluation function. So what should happen is that whatever you provide to me as an evaluation function is what I then should use to find the best model, okay? Which brings us to the last part, which is optimization. Optimization is the process by which I find the hypothesis in the space defined by the representation that maximizes my evaluation measure. And here there's a very natural combination of ideas from the evolutionaries and the connections, which is, remember, we're trying to learn a bunch of weighted formulas the formulas are trees of subformulas connected by and and or and implication and so on. So I can discover those by genetic programming. And then the weights I can discover by backpropagation, in particular by doing backpropagation through the proof trees that I used to answer questions in the past, okay? To infer that, you know, Socrates is mortal given that he's human and, and, and so on, okay? So with, with all of these ideas together, we actually have at this point something that looks uh, like it might be the master algorithm. And, uh, and some of the more optimist people would say, well, okay, at this point, you know, we will be done. Uh, I actually am skeptical of that. I can't prove that that's not the answer, but I have a feeling that it's not. I have a feeling that even after we have unified all of these things, there'll still be something missing. Uh, it may, you know, in the, in, the, in the same way, maybe that, you know, the standard model is still missing gravity. So I think there are some very important ideas in machine learning that are actually not present in any of these paradigms. So maybe we need a sixth paradigm to combine with the other five. Uh, one way or another, I think we need new ideas. And in fact, I think that ironically, people from outside the field, people from outside AI are actually more likely to come up with those ideas than those of us who already, you know, we already belong to one of these tribes. We already think along the tracks of one paradigm. So it's actually, hard to see outside of that. And in fact, one of the reasons I wrote the mass algorithm was try to, you know, to tell people, you know, about the field such that they might have ideas that we wouldn't, you know, maybe some kid in a garage will actually come up with, with, with a key idea. So, uh, um, you know, if you have such an idea, please let me know so I can publish it. So um, let me conclude by talking a little bit about some of the applications and implications of, of, of machine learning as we go forward, and in particular, uh, you know, of what will happen uh, if or when we are able to discover such a universal learner. And of course, you know, all I can do is give a few examples, but I think I, I you know, but I've chosen a few on that I think are both 
representative and, 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 and very important each in its own right. So one of them, of course, is home robots. Uh, we would all like to have a robot that does the dishes and makes the beds and vacuums the floors and maybe even looks after the children. But we don't have that yet. Uh, why is that? Well, first of all, uh, we can't do it without machine learning. I think everybody agrees with that at this point. But the other problem is that our current learning algorithms aren't good enough for it. A home robot in the course of an ordinary day will, will run across every one of those five problems multiple times. So we need an algorithm that is able to solve all five at the same time. We can try to just engineer, cobble together pieces, and people have been trying to do that for decades, but then you run into this wall of complexity and, and, you know, and still aren't able to do it. So with the universal learner, we will have home robots. Without one, you know, I think it's much more doubtful. Uh, here's another one, uh, a very important one these days. Uh, all of the major tech companies are trying to build something like a worldwide brain uh, in the sense of taking all the, all the web and turning into a knowledge base. Uh, you know, these days, the way you use a search engine is you type in some keywords and you get back some pages. What you'd really like to do is to ask questions and get answers, right? But for that, you have to turn all those web pages that are mostly natural language into a knowledge base. So you need symbolic learning, but there's gonna be a lot of noise and ambiguity. So you need probabilistic learning. So once again, you need to combine all these five to really solve that problem. Here's another one, maybe the most important one of all of them, cancer. Why haven't we cured cancer yet? Because cancer is not a single disease, it's many. Everyone's cancer is different and the same cancer mutates over time. So there's never going to be a single drug that cures cancer. The answer, or at least this is what increasingly cancer researchers believe, is something like a learning algorithm that takes in you know, the genome of the patient, their medical history, the mutations in the cancer, and figures out what is the drug or the sequence of drugs or the combination of drugs or maybe even a drug specially designed for that cancer that kills the, the, the tumor cells while leaving the, the good ones in heart. But in order to do that, you need to understand how cells work, metabolism, you know, uh, gene regulation, et cetera, et cetera. And then once again, you know, we have a lot of data these days, that's the good part, but we, you know, no single of the machine learning arms that we have today is able to do this. But with the universal learner, uh, we, we will be able to do it. And then finally, um, I mentioned recommender systems. If you think about what we have today, right? You know, these recommender systems interact with us constantly, but what we have is a bunch of different little recommender systems uh, that each, you know, look at a sliver of us. So Netflix knows about my movie tastes and, you know, Spotify knows about my tastes in music and so on. And they're not that good because none of them know you that well. They're good enough to be useful, but they're a far cry from what they could be. What I would like as a consumer is to have a model of me that is learned from all the data that I generate. And then that model can make recommendations that are very informed and very intelligent. And again, to do that, I learn I need to combine all different types of learning. I also need to combine you know, all different types of data, which of course raises its own issues. But I think once this has happened, then again, we are, we're, we're certainly uh, you know, uh, making, making progress in that direction because it's so important and, you know, and, and economically significant. Uh, we, this is, I think, where, where we will eventually get to. Of course, th these are just some of the applications. And of course, there's many other implications, dangers, opportunities that come up. Um, but um, I think I'll stop there. Um, you know, um, I will answer your questions and also uh, to learn more about all of these things. Um, um, read the master algorithm because that's exactly what I what I wrote it for. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Pedro. It's a, such a huge set of topics. Uh, it's hard to cover in one one hour lecture. So this is something of a teaser, right? And people exactly. should read your book because it does give a, a really terrific overview of, of the field and uh, it's good stimulation for thought. I'm going to start with one question of my own. And then we'll go to Frederica, and then we'll go to, uh, to Charles Wayne. So my, my question is just to ask for a little more information. Uh, you showed early on a slide uh, with a picture of a machine in the background that does molecular biology experiments, which of course, if I, if I was still in uh, the business of being a molecular biologist, I might be a little worried about my future. But I, I wonder if you could tell me a little more about that particular um, program and device and and who's doing it? Yeah, so I mean, actually, um, 
I mean, I know many biologists who are into machine learning and they, they don't fear for their future. On the contrary, right? They, they salivate when, when they think of having, you know, instead of a dozen of postdocs, having, you know, a whole bunch of these machines uh, that never tire and keep working. So, you know, you as the head of a lab, right, will be able to do more research and better, hopefully, uh, we, if you have some of these machines than, than if you don't have them. So the, the, the project that I, I mean, there's a whole different, you know, things in this area, but the project that you saw in that slide, uh, you know, Ross King is a researcher that um, is at the University of Manchester. Um, and they, they started out just doing this inverted deduction for biology problems. And you can do it for many little problems one at a time. And then they decided to take it one step further and really try to build a complete, what is, I think, uh, remarkable about this project. It is, it is in some sense an end-to-end -end biologist. So in addition to generating the hypothesis, then they, they, using the same type of methodology, generate the experiments to test the hypothesis. So the setup that you have has a number of machines. It has a microarray, it has a gene sequencer, and then, and then what he figures out is like, you know, it has formulas literally in logic saying, what is the information that these things, you know, give you? And, in, and then it has like a knowledge base of like, you know, yeast metabolism, for example. And, 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 and then it, you know, and then it chugs along, right? And, and then it formulates a hypothesis, it formulates the experiment or experiments to test it. And then there's literally, you know, a, a, a robotic circuitry that carries out the experiments, right? In, which, if you think about it, is a natural extension of what is already happening with a lot of these like microarrays and whatnot. It's already, you know, uh, largely robotic, right? So, so part of what's beautiful about this project is that they all they had to do was intelligently put together pieces that were already there and say, hey, look, we can have a complete scientist. Yeah, I was cheating a little bit. In the pharmaceutical industry, they have a cold room cabinets and freezers full of hundreds of thousands of compounds and robots that retrieve them and put them into a you know fluid flow system and and test them against various cell lines for various parameters. And all of that's done automatically. But they exactly. don't have so much of the hypothesis generation and experimental design being completely automated. So that's yeah, the newer part to me. Yeah, one thing that I didn't touch on that is actually a very important one these days is um, to use machine learning for drug design. Right, you know, the thing that makes drugs so costly is that they tend to fail late in the pipeline after you've already spent billions of dollars on human trials. And actually machine learning is great for this because what you do is you learn from all the, you know, for example, one, a traditional task is like predict mutagenicity, right? Or toxicity, right? And, and, and we have large databases of this and we can try to predict, well, if I give you this new molecule, will it, you know, be mutagenic? You know, will it be toxic, right? And I can try to design literally, you know, uh, you know, residue by residue or, or atom by atom even, I can try to design drugs that will slot where I want them and not slot where I don't want them. And the, the benefit of doing this in silico as it's called, right? There's in vivo, in vitro, but now there's in silico is that you can try, you know, a billion drugs in a year at a fraction of the cost that it would take to try just one. And of course the process is not perfect. But what it does is it weeds out, you know, the 99% of candidates that don't look so promising and, and you know, and essentially make the whole process viable where it, where it might not be otherwise. It also extracts a lot of information from white chemistry experiments. I have a client that basically is uh, carrying out a certain kind of white chemistry and then extracting valuable information about whether or not compounds are toxic or where their off target effects might be using a machine learning algorithm. So, okay, um, I thank you for that indulging me. Let me just say to people who want to ask questions that there's a couple of ways you can ask questions. If you're a Zoom participant, you can raise your Zoom hand to ask a question and I'll call on you and you'll be able to ask your, ask your question by unmuting your mic and speaking. You are a Zoom participant. You can also ask a question in the Zoom Q&A panel. I know sometimes people like to do that and they want to be heard, but they uh, didn't raise their hand. So we sort of go in the opposite direction. If you put a question in the Zoom Q&A panel and you don't want me to call on you to unmute your mic, say that you want me to read it out loud or say you don't want to be called on. If you are participating on the YouTube stream, then you can add your question to the chat box and it will be relayed to me and I will read it out loud. And all text questions, whether they're entered on the Zoom Q&A panel or they're conveyed to me from the 
YouTube chat box will be read out loud so that everybody knows what they are, including the speaker. So with that, let me call on Frederica Derema. Uh, Frederica, you uh, can unmute your mic and ask your question. Yes, thank you. Larry. Questions, I think you had three of them. Uh, can you hear me now? I unmuted myself. Yes, you thank can you, Larry, hear me. and uh, uh, thank you, Pedro, for their, your very nice uh, encyclopedic kind of um, recounting of a lot of aspects, AI, ML, genetic algorithms, and mentioning all the luminaries in these uh, areas. Uh, in mentioning back propagation, uh, I was disappointed you did not mention that uh, it was Paul Werbos in 74 actually, who actually started uh, kind of the back propagation ideas. And uh, uh, Paul and I were colleagues at the, the National Science Foundation, so I'm very familiar with this work. Uh, and the, and a lot of the other that mentioned, uh, but also and maybe going to the last uh, statements that you made, uh, you know, where are the new ideas? Uh, let me say that you know certainly uh, machine learning, AI, and uh, wrongly a few uh, many people conflate machine learning with AI, which is not. But you know it's not a panacea solution as we know. And you also focused your kind of um, uh, presentation in um, systems that are um, not dynamic systems, which uh, change conditions uh, very quickly. And when you mentioned representations, you mentioned uh, ML statistical kind of methods, uh, but also there are numeric agent based. Uh, you did mention graph modeling. Um, so, um, one other aspect is that, um, you know, all these methods uh, lack, for example, um, if in certain applications, let's say the physics or Larry's question about biology and also ML for drug design. Uh, ML is a fitting method, but it lacks also the biology, the chemistry, the physics information, which, uh, as I like to say, um, if you have a physics cognizant kind of model, uh, then you don't go off the rails as ML can become, you know, a, a fitting uh, algorithm that if you feed, if you feed it uh, junk data, it will produce junk results, all right? So it goes off the rails, I like, I like to say. Whereas in models where you include the physics, the chemistry, the biology, then you don't, you know, have this, uh, danger of going off the rails. So I, I, I kind of like us to be more cognizant of, um, you know, you said, what, where are the new ideas? I think, you know, the more system cognizant models need to be used in conjunction with ML, for example. And a, and a related thing, you mentioned we need the kind of a worldwide brain or- oh, Wait, 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 uh, before you go on um, and, you know, Let's take these things one at a time. So you mentioned that uh, a backprop was really invented by Paul Werbos. Actually, the history is even better than that, right? Is that to our knowledge, uh, the first time backprop was proposed was actually in the control systems literature by Bryson and Ho in the 1960s, okay. which is particularly ironic because in 1969, Minsky and Papert wrote this famous book saying perceptrons don't work and they never will and neural networks died for, for 15 years. It turns <laughs> out that what they said was impossible had already been invented in a different field, right? And, and in fact, many and in fact, I know several people, including Jan Lecan, who independently discovered backprop, independently from Romo Hart, Hinton, and Williams. So in fact, the joke is that you know they discovered backprop by, by the same standard that Columbus discovered America. He wasn't the first one to discover America, he was the last one. Okay because that was the time when it actually stayed. And in fact, Jan Lecun, who again, you know, he's the world's biggest fan of backprop and invented it independently. He actually says that really the inventor of backprop is Leibniz because it's just the chain rule of differentiation. So you're right. I mean, Paul Werbus was actually the first important predecessor to have been discovered once backprop became big, but, but it's actually, I think, a great object lesson in the history of science and how fields can discover the same ideas and, you know, be, you know, without discovering each other uh, for, for decades in, 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 in many cases. So that, there's that interesting history to backprop. On the, on the question, which of course is very important to scientists of whether machine learning is just curve fitting. Well, um, 
I was listening to you and I was smiling because I was thinking, you must be a fan of symbolic learning because this is exactly what symbolic learning is all about, is no, we're not just going to fit a curve from scratch, like you know, you see in statistics or like a lot of connections to do. We are going to start the system with our knowledge of the science, with our knowledge of biology, with the equations, with the conservation laws of physics. And then we're going to learn on top of that, as a result of which the knowledge that we learn is A, consistent with what we had before, and B, uh, you know, able to build on it. And in fact, these days, for example, I mentioned this area of neurosymbolic learning. A very, there's a very popular uh, area of people applying uh, deep learning to the sciences, and in particular physics and astronomy and whatnot, where they actually, what they have is neural networks whose architecture respects the conservation laws and the symmetries and et cetera, et cetera, that they believe to hold. Okay? So in that sense, machine learning is very much not just curve fitting, right? It allows you to put in your knowledge. But let me also put in a word of caution here. Often the point of machine learning is to discover the things that you thought you knew, but were wrong. So as much as we want to be able to draw on the existing knowledge of the scientists in the field, one of the big advantages of machine learning is that it also allows us to go beyond that and say, well, actually, you know, you seem to believe in X, but you know, there's a lot of data here that says the opposite. So maybe you should think again. So thank you. I, I, so don't get me wrong. I didn't mean that machine learning should be excluded. I think machine learning should be in conjunction with a system cognition model, whether it's the physics, the chemistry, the biology and so on. I, and so thank you. Uh, I mean, I agree with, with what you said, uh, you know, your latest comments. Uh, yes, I, I think they're in line with what I said. And the other question I had is um, you talked about, um, a, you know, a, to, to have a worldwide brain and, 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 and for cancer kind of uh, uh, analysis and so on. So where do you see the Watson system that was a system that was developed many years ago, uh, you know, and, and and so, what, and of course, you know, we know a number of kind of issues uh, that, um, you know, in terms of the cancer research uh, contribution, but it wasn't that one of the attempts for a worldwide brain, for example, and what, what do you think about that? So uh, Watson is actually a great example and a cautionary tale. So Watson started life as a system to play Jeopardy, right? Correct. And it was very successful at that. It became the Jeopardy champ, right? And, you know, IBM has actually a long history, you know, starting with checkers, right? Uh, the world's first computer checkers program was developed by an okay. IBM researcher called okay. Arthur Samuel. And, you know, and, and, and Thomas Watson, the president of IBM, said, when this result is published, the stock of IBM will go up by 10%. And it went up by 17 because it's like, wow, computers can do this now. And then, of course, you know, the blue chess and whatnot, right? So okay. IBM has a long history of doing this. And then what happened is that they decided to take Watson and turn it into something that could be used you know, for finance, telecoms, healthcare was a great you know, area where they made a big push, right? But the problem is that uh, Watson did not succeed at these things in the end, right? So it actually wound up giving itself and IBM a bad name, right? And, and why was that? Because, and unlike, you know, there were a lot of us in the field saying, you know, warning them about this, right? And the problem with Watson is that it wasn't really, you know, like I talked here about, you know, the master algorithm versus like, you know, clutching a bunch of things together. Watson was precisely an example of the latter. It was a bunch of modules that were put together to do, to play Jeopardy. And then, you know, like just, you know, trying to do medicine based on that was, was really not the way to go, right? A lot of things, you know, didn't apply or actually hurt more than they helped. And Watson won that being a name that IBM used for whatever package of AI solutions they had to propose, okay? I would not call Watson an attempt at the worldwide brain in the same way that, for example, Google or Microsoft has what they call a knowledge graph, which is an attempt to turn, you know, all of the web or ultimately all of the knowledge in the world into one algorithm, right? I could see Watson potentially growing into that, but that's not the direction that IBM took it in. And again, I think the problem with what IBM did is that it had, in some ways, it was a very old fashioned AI approach. I mean, it had machine learning in it, but it had a lot of like knowledge engineering and they, they didn't really use the power of modern machine learning in the way that they should have. And so the system wound up being more brittle and not as flexible, not as generalizable as it should be. So a lot of the things that Watson was not doing well 
can be done better by other AI systems, in particular using machine learning learning algorithms. And I think IBM has learned that lesson, right? Like they've, you know, they bought a company for a pretty penny, basically for the large amount of, of um, you know, X-rays that it has, so that they can turn, they can train, you know, a, an automated radiologist on it, right? Which is more the kind of thing that the Googles and Facebooks and Amazons of this world have been doing for a while. So I think, you know, IBM, you know, another thing about IBM is that often the marketing runs ahead of the technology. Mm -hmm. So I think they got burned with that. I think there's also a cautionary tale. Uh, people with AI often get, you know, overexcited about what, you know, uh, what it can do, right? It's very important to understand what it can and it can't. And I think people at IBM at the highest levels didn't quite understand what the limitations of something like Watson were. Let's, let's move on, Federica, to uh, some other questions. Thanks so much for asking these questions. So uh, we have some questions from Charles Wayne. Charles, can you turn on your mic and ask your questions? Yes. Um, so AlphaGo is quite an impressive achievement. What, under, what approach underlies that? Uh, good question. So um, AlphaGo is basically a reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, I did not, you know, um, I, 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 in this talk, I stayed mostly with the simplest tasks, which are one shot prediction. But to control an agent, you need something like reinforcement learning, right? And the idea in reinforcement learning is that you make a sequence of actions and you only find out whether they were good or bad after a while. Like, for example, when playing a game like Go, I make a move, but I don't immediately know if it's good or bad. I only know at the end, did I win or lose the game or, or, or tie, right? So, so in a way, reinforcement learning is about propagating the information that you get when you get those rewards, right? It's again, reinforcement learning is inspired a lot by the, uh, you know, animal psychology literature. And, you know, that's actually where the expression reinforcement learning comes from and trying to propagate the signal backwards through time, right? So at its core, AlphaGo is a reinforcement learning algorithm, but then what makes it work is actually a couple of things that, you know, um, you will not be surprised by after hearing my talk. One is, he uses neural networks to do the perceptual work of understanding the board. Right? You know, deep learning these days is very good at vision and Go is different from chess in that it's almost a pattern recognition problem, right? You know, it's like the best Go prey is kind of look at a board and have intuitions about what's happening there and what to do that the amateurs don't. And we never knew how to program this, but now you, you can just have a neural network learning. The other thing they use is that gets less airplay than the deep learning, but is equally important is what's called Monte Carlo tree search, which is a classic symbolic uh, search method. So yeah. AlphaGo achieved this success really by combining uh, these three things, combining a symbolic method with, with, a, with a, uh, you know, to do the search for moves with a neural net network method to, to, you know, to do the perception of the board. And again, this is not unlike what human beings do, right? You can also think of Again, there's a lot of neuroscience and psychology evidence that we human beings do reinforcement learning with you know, our visual system, which is a big neural network to do the pattern recognition. And then with, with, you know, with search to figure out, you know, like, what should I do? And if I do this, will you do that? So it's, it's a system that I think is a very good example of how AI can be successful and what it takes to be successful. Thank you. Should I, I ask the second question? Yeah, you should. Okay, the other question, uh, this is much harder actually, is if you wanted to draw fair voting districts, what kind of algorithmic approach would you use? Well, uh, good question, right? I don't think it takes AI to solve that question, but, but the spirit of the solution is very similar to what a lot of AI does. And again, uh, I go back to the representation, it, uh, evaluation and optimization. Right. First of all, you need to decide what are the permissible boundaries, right? And you need a language in which those boundaries get expressed, right? And in fact, as you know, there's a lot of you know things that say, well, you know, there's a limit to, for example, how jagged the boundaries can be and things like that, right? And then this is actually the most important part where I think we, the public, we, the people, the voters need to be involved is, you know, you can have within this realm of shapes, call it the hypothesis space, right? For the, you know, for the voting districts, right? Uh, there's a huge variety. What distinguishes a better one from a worse one, right? What is it that you're trying to optimize, right? 
And, you know, if I'm a politician trying to get reelected, I'll try to come up with the criteria that favors the districts that I want, right? So this is why I have to be very careful and make sure that this is actually being done in a way that is sensible, right? And then finally, you need an optimizer that will find those frontiers, but, you know, we got those, right? That's, that's a technical problem, right? That's just like, you know, running the engine. And, and, and as far as optimization goes, this is a two-dimensional problem. It's ridiculously easy compared to the problems that we solve in AI. So I go back to like, the key thing is like, we need to agree on what is the evaluation function. That is actually not simple because there's, you know, sociological, there's just a lot of different things that come into that and a lot of different people and social groups with different motivations that want to have a say in that. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I'll stick by two cents in that. People go fair, right? But the definition of fair is a lot more subtle and complex when it comes to drawing voting district lines. There's, there's no simple definition of fairness there. And you're right, it depends on, you know, if you're drawing a line, you're just, you're, it's going to affect your strength of representation, then you're going to want it one way. And if uh, you're the other guy, you might want it a different way. And it's not necessarily so simple to say this is fair and that's not. It's a choice that we make politically. So yeah. anyway, let's move on. I, in fact, so just to add something to that, fairness in AI is actually, there's a lot of research on that these days. And you know, the early research was naive in that I just, you know, I had some criterion of fairness that I wrote down as a formula. And I imagined that this was the fairness, right? <laughs> this was like typical engineer naive take, right? <laughs> and, 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 but now, right, the field is a little bit more mature. And people understand that there are all these different definitions of fairness and no one that will, everyone will agree on eventually. And in fact, there's these theorems that say, right, there is no single measure of fairness that will satisfy simultaneously all the intuitive properties that we want out of fairness, right? There's this negative result that says, whatever you do, there will always be someone who calls it unfair by their measure. And that's just a mathematical reality. It's true, it's political reality. All right, uh, we have Joel Wilson. Uh, Joel, would you ask your question? Yes, uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, sir. Uh, I was wondering, it, the, the way you're talking, you're talking about the master algorithm having aspects of each of them, it, it almost makes me think of each of the approaches as like a basis vector that forms a vector space and the master algorithm is, is finding a pathway in that space that optimizes either ma maximizes or minimizes something. H has there been any talk of modeling it like a problem in calculus of variations, which is you have two points, find the path that minimizes this mathematical function called the functional, or the functional is what you're looking for. Well, as you can imagine, right, calculus of variations is widely applied in machine learning. Right, hmm. uh, you know, left and right, and moreover, almost you know, I, I often joke to my students that whatever area of mathematics you like, uh, you can just come and apply it in machine learning, <laughs> and it'll probably be useful. Uh, I, I mean, I like I like your analogy. Uh, I would say that it's you know, but it's it's very it's a little oversimplified. I would say okay. not so much that each of the paradigms is one basis vector in the space. Although again, I think that's a good analogy. It's more like each of these paradigms is a subspace of already very high dimensionality. And gotcha. now what we need is a, is a space that combines all of them. And the combination is not going to be linear. It's going to be nonlinear. In fact, right, right. a lot of the most interesting machine learning work is precisely on nonlinear manifolds. And mm -hmm. you know, um, I think you would find a lot in the current machine learning literature very congenial uh, to this idea. Yeah. OK. Thank you, sir. So we have a few questions uh, from YouTube. So I've got to sort of paraphrase and, and, and condense the first one. And it's basically how, how, is, how is quantum computing, um, how do we say, ah, let me say that's a question from oh, Jorge Aponte. And I hope I get it right, Jorge. I could read it out loud. I'll just say, how is quantum computing broken the law, rules of thinking? developing new paths for unknown algorithms and discovering new answers. But I might put that in a little less uh, extrapolated way and say, as you look at what quantum computing can do that conventional computing can't do, 
how do you think that will uh, improve or expand the capabilities of, of these various approaches to uh, machine learning and AI? Right, so quantum computing is potentially a very exciting development, um, but we don't know if it'll pan out yet. If it does pan out, and you know, fingers crossed, we're hoping it will, uh, the consensus at this point is that it will not be a replacement for general purpose computers. It will be good for specific types of problems. And, and different types of quantum computing, there are many different types. There's like, you know, topological, adiabatic, you know, et cetera, et cetera, are good for different problems. Now, uh, luckily, the problems that we deal with in AI, as we've mentioned already a couple of times, are usually optimization problems which are precisely a kind of problem for which quantum computing might be very good. In particular, uh, um, you know, adiabatic uh, quantum computing, which is this idea that you can have um, solve, you know, the problem in a lot of optimization problems and very much so in AI almost by definition is that you have these optimization problems that don't have a single global minimum. They have a lot of local ones. And then you get stuck in the local ones and finding the global one is, you know, an exponentially hard problem. Well, the idea in adiabatic quantum computing is that you can escape from the local optima by using quantum tunneling, okay? <laughs> and there's this company called D-Wave that does this. It's very controversial. They claim that they've done it. Other people say, not really. They have these papers in nature showing the results. Other people say, but those results really, you know, they look like it, but they're really obtainable. So I don't know, I'm not an expert. But supposing that at that type of quantum computing pans out, this would be a game changer for AI because it would mean that these intractable problems would suddenly become tractable. Is this, still going, is this all going to happen or not? I really don't know, but uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, we have a question from Bruce Barry. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one. Has artificial intelligence been able to find proofs of mathematical conjectures or discover new theorems that are, quote, interesting, close quote? And, uh, so it has, in fact, this was one of the earliest things that people did with AI, because actually it was also not as computationally demanding as things like computer vision. Uh, there was this program from, you know, two AI pioneers, uh, Newell and Simon, uh, uh, called the Logic Theorist, which basically did proofs. And what they did was very interesting. They, they had people do proofs and solve math problems and talk aloud, right? It's what's called protocol analysis in, in psychology, explain what they were doing. And then they extracted the principles and they built a system based on that. And the ideas you know, of how to solve problems, you know, these things about search spaces and search operators and meanings and all that are still with us today. Um, so they started out rediscovering uh, you know, proofs of known theorems, which was the obvious thing to do. Uh, but then you know, over the decades, this has been going on, uh, you know, computers started discovering uh, new results. Uh, you know, there was this program called AM um, um, by a guy called Doug Lennett. And then Eurisco that discovered, you know, new results in mathematics. Uh, but then, it, you know, people questioned that because along with those new results, they also discovered a lot of crap, right? They proved a lot of useless theorems. And the question is like, how can you tell if a result is interesting or not? But actually these days we're at the point where you do discover new interesting results by computer and where there are important proofs of theorems that were done partly or wholly by computer. In fact, you know, these days, increasingly in mathematics, and also there'll be even more in the future, is as a mathematician, you have to use computers just as much as any other scientist. Trying to do a proof all by yourself is hopeless. You're gonna use a computer to prove either the whole conjecture or some important parts of it. Yes, yeah. And in fact, some people resist this notion, maybe the older generation of mathematicians, while the new one is completely comfortable with it. And the, you know, I think the older generations can say, well, I don't trust a proof until it's been done by a, verified by a human which I find curious because I don't trust the proof until it's been verified by a computer, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Proofs, I mean, look, a, a, a compiler, right? A, you know, a, a program is, is, is a kind of proof really, right? And we know programs are full of bugs because compilers find them all the time, right? Now, why would the proof not have bugs when a program has, has bugs? Of course, proofs have bugs, right? So I think what we're going to have in mathematics going forward is actually what we already have in other areas. And in chess, they call centaurs, right? The best chess players in the world are not humans, but they're also not machines, currently to what people think. They are collaborations of humans and machines. And, and I think the same thing will be true in many fields, including in mathematics is, you know, 
you're going to prove theorems using a combination of you, the mathematician, and the computer. And you, the mathematician, have to understand what the computer can do well and way better in larger quantities than you can, like, you know, go through very large, you know, proof DAGs and, and whatnot, and what only you can do, right? And that combination, I think, is, 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 is going to be, I think, what dominates for the, for the foreseeable future. I think it, it's become an uh, integrated part of doing math. I think the first dramatic example was the four color map theory. Yeah. And exactly. uh, it, was, it was unprovable, but it was eventually proved by a combination of empirical demonstration using a computer plus uh, some formulas that basically were valid within certain parameters, but not others. And the, and the empirical study on the computer went through all the parts that it, uh, the formula didn't cover and filled yeah. in the blanks. So, exactly. um, yeah, by the way, uh, Bruce, there's a talk by Hod Lipson. Um, given to PSW some years ago, in which he talked about feeding data for a double pendulum into a learning program. And the program spit out a bunch of formula, formulae. And some of them were the ones that nobody had ever seen before. So that yeah. was one example of uh, a computer spitting out a new formula that turned out to be true to describe an empirical phenomena that was pretty well known. So this is actually the same. Talk. This is the same Hot Lipson that that yes. made those robots that I showed earlier. And in fact, yes. one area that he's worked a lot in is this area of discovering things like differential equations from data. So he's one of the yes. he, he talked a little bit about his robots also at the time. This is quite a few years ago. I, I hope we'll come back in a year or two and yeah. tell us more. So I think maybe one of the last questions here also from YouTube. In the news lately, AI used by, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is from uh, Seven Aiden. He asks, in the news lately, AI is used by law enforcement and, and banking have learned the racism of the user, the race of the users, or racism of the users by through the learning data with embedded biases, how can we guard against such biases? And can AI inform us of our biases? So I think the last part is the question, how can we, how can we guard against biases using AI and in AI? And can AI help us learn about our own biases and perhaps prevent us from interjecting them improperly into our evaluations of other people. Yeah, so there's a lot of, you know, as I'm sure you've all noticed, there's a lot of controversy swirling around the use of AI for various things these days. And the question is, you know, what to think of all this. And the, the you know, policing is one example, you know, banking, there's, you know, hiring, there's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them. And the thing to realize is that what we're seeing today, and they're gonna see even more in the future is decisions that used to be made by humans are now made by AI algorithms. Okay. And of course, you know, there are many ways in which human decisions went, you know, astray, and we made laws to prevent that from happening, like, you know, discriminating on the basis of race or gender, you know, redlining, et cetera, et cetera, right? And now the question is, what happens when these decisions are made by computers instead of by humans? And a lot of people are very worried that the computers will perpetuate human biases or even increase them. But honestly, those of us who know algorithms better find this a little strange because the first thing to realize about computers, um, the, there's more, but you know, to start with the first one, a computer a priori is much less biased than a human because it doesn't have all those sources of unconscious bias, right? You know, there's all this literature about how machine learning algorithms have they discriminate against blacks, you know, in face recognition. They, I mean, the list goes on. And the thing to realize is that a machine learning algorithm is mathematically incapable of having race and gender biases. It's like, you know, it, a machine learning algorithm is a big equation, right? Y equals AX plus B doesn't know about, you know, demographic variables. Now the machine learning algorithm is then applied to data that could have biases, right? If that data was from loan officers that gave loans to whites but not to blacks, it's going to learn to copy, you know, those mistakes, right? And that's 
what we should be concerned with, right? Now, having said that, there's a very important distinction that needs to be made, and, and I, I seldom see made, it says, it's one thing to learn from data that was generated by humans, like what did the human loan officer say? It's another thing to learn from the outcome. Did this person default or not? When you're learning from the outcome, you are not partaking of the human biases of the people who are making decisions before you. The other thing about, you know, by the way, you know, uh, uh, Danny Tversky in Thinking Fast and Slow has a whole chapter about how algorithms make decisions better than humans. And this has been known, you know, for decades, right? So the whole paranoia about algorithms being biased is a little odd, to be frank. Having said that, there are a lot of, you know, problems that, where things can creep in, and we have to be on guard for that. But the final thing that I want to, you know, uh, leave in your mind is the following. Human biases are very hard to suss out, right? The reason, for example, the doctrine of disparate impact exists and is very controversial is that it's hard to prove intent, right? And it's hard to change people's minds. Well, we don't have that problem with algorithms. Algorithms aren't gonna perpetuate anything unless we make them, right? I can look at the algorithm and what it's doing, right? I can inspect an algorithm in a way that I can't inspect the human brain and I can change an algorithm in a way that I can change a human brain. So in almost every one of these regards, using more algorithms in decision-making, if you do it properly with safeguards against data biases and biases by the data scientists and whatnot, using algorithms for things like hiring, you know, predictive policing, sentencing, et cetera, et cetera, will be a huge improvement in making society fair. Well, I'm with you. So maybe that's a good place to stop um, if you have, uh, I guess I just can thank you very much for generously sharing your time with PSW and giving this very informative lecture and answering all of these questions. It's been a real pleasure to have you. And um, again, thank you. I'm sorry we can't present you with the usual plaque and uh, signed copy of the first volume of the PSW Bulletin because you're not here, but you do have a rain check to come and join any PSW meeting if you happen to be in town and if not, and get in touch with us and we will host you to dinner at the Cosmos Club, even if there's no meeting. So we do look forward to meeting with you in person when once again, we are permitted to do that and you are traveling from your side of the country to ours. So thank you very much, Pedro, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me and, and I'll keep that invitation in mind. Very good. So before the audience goes, we have a few important notes. The 2445th meeting of the society in the next lecture will be on Friday, September 24th. The speaker will be John Moult, professor in the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research at the University of Maryland. And his lecture will be on predicting protein structure and function. AI finally cracks the code. It's a good follow on to tonight's lecture. Uh, he will talk about AlphaFold and the recent great success by the Berkeley Group as well as by DeepMind. I'm predicting uh, protein structure from primary amino acid sequence data, solving a long standing problem, at least to a large extent, in uh, molecular biology. So his lecture will be on, will highlight these recent improvements. In solving this key problem in biology using machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms, John actually last spoke at the 2101st meeting on February 19th, 1999, over 22 years ago. There's been quite a bit of progress since then. Minutes of that talk are available on the PSW website, but that was before we began video recordings. The 2446th meeting will be on Friday, October 8th. The speaker will be Olivier Goyen, astronomer and professor at the Stewart Observatory and the University of Arizona. And his lecture will be on adaptive optics and how adaptive optics enable ground-based observatories with resolving power exceeding that of the Hubble telescope by more than an order of magnitude. And that talk, will be followed at the 2447th meeting on Friday, October 22, by Feng Chuan Lu, 
who is the project director of the 30 meter telescope project. And he naturally will be speaking on the TMT and will in part illustrate the use of adaptive optics in that project and the great improvements that AO has allowed in these large ground-based telescope observatories. Uh, I should note that that will be the second of three talks on the major ground-based telescope, optical telescope projects that are underway in the world. The GMT, which we heard about last spring, the TMT that we'll hear about on October 22nd, and the uh, large European uh, 30 meter telescope that we're gonna hear about um, in the spring, hopefully. The 2448th meeting will be on Friday, November 5th. The speaker will be Ronnie Amaro. Ronnie holds an endowed professorship at the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. She will be speaking on virus dynamics, including how SARS-CoV-2 binds to and enters cells. The 2,449th meeting will be on November 19th, and the speaker is to be announced at a later date. Uh, the 2,450th meeting will be on Friday, December 3rd. This meeting will coincide with, PSW, with PSO's DuPont Summit, to which all PSW members are invited, and the speaker will be announced at a later date. And the last meeting of the fall will be the 2,451st meeting, on Friday, December 17th. And the speaker will be Sean Andrews, who's an astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And he will be speaking on the current understandings of how planets are formed, both in our solar system and around other stars. Please join us for these meetings. Last but not least, let's thank our production crew for tonight's meeting, James Hewen. Anne McQueen, Robin Taylor. Thank you, crew. With that, I will adjourn the meeting. I will adjourn the 2,444th meeting of the society to everybody's post-meeting social hour. I wish everyone a good evening. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>